You're watching your worst friend going deeper, season five. Today's guest, legendary adult film director, Jim Powers. Here's your hosts, Matt and Shane. You're watching YWF Going Deeper Season 5. I'm Matt, and I'm joined today by my lovely co-host, Shane. What's up? Go to yourworstfriend.com to see all of our other interviews and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at WorstFriendCast. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by a very special guest. You might know him as the director of such cinematic masterpieces as American Bukaki series, Liquid Gold series, and the Guttermouth series, and the Girlvert series. I threw an extra hand in there by accident. He's directed former guests of ours, Sarah J, Anna Fox, Kay Lovely. You can find him on Twitter at Jim Powers XXX. And for links to everything we're going to talk about today, you can check out the episode description below. Ladies and gentlemen, join us in welcoming to the show the legendary director, Jim Powers. Jim, thank you very much for coming on with us tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, so as I was telling you before the show started, Shane and I are right around the age where, you know, we got the first America online, you'd get the discs in the mail. And then right after that step is when you could really start hitting websites hard. Okay. Um, and something else hard too. I'm sure. I'm the sure. Mail order era. <laughs> Would you? Are you one of those people that say every day I wake up is my prime, or do you think maybe that was your prime back then? Oh God, I didn't think it was my prime at the time. I just, I just keep on stumbling through life, so it's. I, I don't really think it's any different nowadays for the most part. I think it was a little crazier back then for the type of stuff we were doing. So it was, it was just a different world. But you know, things change. The more it changes, the more it stays the same. So. For sure. For sure. So how did you, and I've done a little background research, but for the audience, how did you initially get into the industry? Um, I started out, we were going to make um, kickboxing videos, what it started out huh. as. And it's, you've heard the story, but it's a long story short. Uh, ends up being, my partner goes, we can't go into business with this guy. He used to shoot porn movies. There's no way we can be involved with him. Why? He goes, well, that's the mafia. You know, and the mafia runs porn. So I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Let's not get into porn. And <laughs> ending one leads to another. Uh, and one, and uh, we started making porn movies because one of the distributors that was going to handle that when we pulled out the kickboxing thing said, you guys should be in porn. So we set up a distributorship. It uh, didn't really work out. So I headed back to California. This was back in Florida, back in 1990 with Buck Adams. Um, you might remember Buck Adams. Sure. He's a director of the... 80s. He's Amber Lynn's brother is who he is. Okay. Well, he's been dead for a while. And so anyway, we came out to California to shoot our first movie, which was a 35 millimeter film. My first movie. Okay. So um, hey, how do I pull this thing off the screen? Or does it stay up there? This meeting is being recorded. Can I pull that oh, yeah, off? I think you just hit, uh, got it. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, oh, got, I, it, got, got it. it. Boom, I did it. Wonderful. You. There you go. Um, so, I mean, were you always like a creative guy? Were you an interesting? I know you were back. In, you were in a band back in the day, right? Has that always yeah, just been your thing? Where, yeah, you still are. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, yeah. everybody should check out Kilroy. We're, we're on iTunes. We have a bunch of albums. I played some for Shane before we uh, got you on here today. Well, you played me like twelve seconds. So. Well, it was on. Yeah, it was on iTunes. It was like the preview thing, and I was like, oh, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, I like that. Brutalized. Listen to the new one. Brutalized. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. We'll yeah, check it maybe. Out. Maybe next time, Matt, don't pick one from 1984. No, I was trying to give you the real feel. I was trying to get you, like, you know, a real sense of show who Jim was back in yeah. the day. I wanted to yeah. eventually show you the progression and the evolution of this gentleman here, yeah. okay? It's still the same. Nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Shane and I from high school, yeah. pretty much yeah, the I same like thing, too. Six songs from back then, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, it'll never change. Yeah, now, when you grow up, you're getting closer to death, so don't grow up. It's just how I've always seen it. Exactly. Peter uh, Pan your way through life. Um, so, again, was this, uh, did you get like embedded in the industry and you started to really fall in love with it? Or was it a great way for you to make money and you realized you were good at it and you were able to do it? Did you like the industry when you first got into it? Okay. It, everything for me in the beginning was very accidental. I really wasn't trying to become a pornographer. So I, I did this movie with Buck. And I go, that was a, it was a one-off thing. I mean, what was the point of this? It's not like I want really wanted to be in porn that bad. And 
it is, it's kind of like every it's like everything in porn for the first couple of years for the most part was accidental for me so I, we make this movie so now i'm back in la i gotta get a job so i start working for this guy you know being a pitch man for you know funding for loans and my boss i tell me yeah i made this porn once and this crazy boss i had he goes really you know we need to make some of those amateur movies could could you could you get some girls down here and and, and film me because he was he ran a swinger colony or something. He was the head guy who lived in a swinger, uh, not swinger place, but a nudist colony. And I'm like, what the fuck? But because I knew world modeling, because I did both the one movie, I go get a couple girls. I come back there and he wants me to film them in the office. Here I am in Huntington Beach, you know, this nice corporate building. And on a weekend, I'm filming my boss have sex with these two porn girls. So once again, I mean, and then, you know, the story was like uh, later that year, I just happened to be at ABN Awards. I was with, um, I used to, you know, hang out with No Effects a lot. So I was with No Effects and those guys, and we just went over to the valleys. This is just pure luck. And it happened to be, back in those days, they do the awards at the valleys, and everybody was hanging at the uh, the bar. And, you know, so all of a sudden these porn people knew me from that one movie, and they're, they're like, yeah, man, Jim, you need to make another movie. I'm like, hell no. The movie sucked. I made it. cost a bunch of money. I didn't make any money. I don't want to do it. So um, I don't know if you guys remember the band Strung Out. But, um, no, no. I know no effects. I've heard the name. Out. Yeah. So, so anyway, I got the drummer in me. He's like, well, look, at how much can you make a porn movie for? I could do it. I could have to do the amateur one. And keep in mind, this is 1992, beginning of 92. So... You know, like, and I knew that kind of the amateur rates at the time. I go, well, fuck, I can make a better porn movie than I made for $5,000. So we end up making this movie. Uh, one of the guys in the band, another band, was going to be the director who wrote it and everything. And I was just going to be the producer, put it together. You know, I'm the producer because I never picked up a camera at anything. And I still wasn't trying to be any, you know, there was no Jim Powers or anything back then. And so what happened was I get to the set that morning and he's on acid. He took acid in preparation, <laughs> laying around the grounds, laying there, staring at his cigarette. And I realized what he's doing. He's looking at the trails. I'm like, are you kidding me? You took acid? You have to direct this movie. You know, we're making a movie. <laughs> Got a lot invested in this thing, right? And so I ended up taking over directing the porn. Film. So uh, what, Was it like an easy writer inspired or like, what what kind of porn was it? Like, was he trying to get into like uh, some sort of like? Uh, was he an auteur? Like he was an just, auteur? Yeah. yeah, he was. Yeah. <laughs> was okay, okay. You or was he a guy that. who liked acid? Like you know. <laughs> All right, keep him. Was mind. it his first time? Like, well, this the song like is that what was the one I did the song right about then for no effects? Let me use their music to open the movie. So they had just an S and M Airlines. The movie opens with Vanilla Sax. Okay. Is they just you know, Mike Levy put it on it, and so this movie was about this guy who captures these girls, and he wears a TV on his head because his, the guy who was acting in the movie was in a band called Glue Gun, and that was his shtick on stage. He'd wear a TV on his head, and like TV's taking us over, or whoever knew what it was, some punk band, and so they would be capturing the people. And whatever, having sex. We had all these cut up things on the walls, like cut up magazines and whatever. We thought it was really arty at the time. We're making this punk rock porn. And a lot of these guys are in the movie. If you ever see this old movie, it's never even made it to DVD. Um, it's, it's like music by No Effects, like the Hellcats. You know, like all these punk bands are in this movie and we make this ridiculous movie. And I guess, yeah, to get into the headspace, he was going to be an acid and everything because everybody thought it was going to be a party there. They didn't realize there is any work, and I'd done that film, so I knew you, just, you don't just don't do drugs and make a movie. You know, it's not that <sighs> easy. So I had to take over doing everything. So I don't know. The '60s might disagree with you. <laughs> Did you see early on a lot of porn sets devolve into parties, or no? I feel like not was- not like big name, not like when you were actually in the game, but like when you're really trying to. Because I I feel like I mean I've shot little independent movies and it Isn't takes that... it takes six hours to shoot one scene and it's because everyone's fucking you know making jokes over here doing this by the end you're fucking holding back a tear going we got thirty seconds of footage over six hours mm-hmm. I am fucked and I don't know what to do. Um, Isn't that I kind think... of the point of boogie nights? 
Well, look, well, yeah, but the porn sets themselves are not parties in Boogie Nights. Right, right, that's right. True. Like that that's what they're kind of trying to show, right? Is like the more Mark Wahlberg tries to make it all a porn or a party, like the more he's hurting his career and ruining right. the shoot for everybody else. So I feel like they I mean, like by the nineties, you guys probably had a a pretty smooth routine. Like you had a a, a science for shooting a porn by then, right? Oh okay. so anyway, I never had any training in porn or anything. So here, here's so once again, I make this move. I can't sell it. I'm like, I have nothing to do with porn. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm out of porn again. And I end up selling the movie. This movie is first, this one, the, Hill, the first one, Speed Trap, went to BCA. And then this movie, Hills Have Thighs, went to Midnight. <laughs> now, here's what happened. Here's how I got going in porn. So I go into the Midnight office and I meet the main guy there, Kevin Beecham. And I'm giving him the movie. And he says to me, hey, you want to shoot some amateur scenes from this weekend? And I'm like, well, I don't know anything about shooting. I've never picked up a camera. because it's amateur. You just pick up a camera. I'm like, where do I get the people? He's like, because they're amateurs, right? Because you just go up to people on the street and ask them if they want to fuck. And I go, really? <laughs> That's all I have to do? He goes, yeah. So at the time, my buddy, remember Jughead's Revenge, that band that you guys are probably kind of from that era. Oh, and, and one maybe. of the old nitro bands like offspring and they were yeah. okay, okay. So, yeah so i got him a job over at this one stop at the time and and i tell him about this thing and he goes because he wanted to be in porn and, and, and he's like well i got this guy over here who can book the girls and everything for you and he has access to all of them i'm like all right now oh my back to back up the reason i got this thing is a line called beach bum amateurs uh, there used to be a guy named Chris Alexander who started a company called uh, Anabolic Video. Oh, he yeah. Famous for the gangbangs. Chris had just, I knew Chris when I was trying to book him in the Hills of Thighs. He ended up not doing it. But um, he quit making amateurs because Anabolic had just released their first two movies and was about to take off. And he didn't want to be shooting the amateurs anymore, just his own stuff. Because he did that famous Debbie Diamond gangbang and Trixie Tyler, or whatever, whatever. <laughs> right? right? So anyway, I um, I'm like, okay. So anyway, now I'm going to shoot these amateurs. I get at the time. This is before he was uh, David Lords. David Lords was a salesman at the company. That too, the guy from uh, Jughead's introduced me to, and. Because I thought, okay, it's a beach movie. You have to shoot it at the beach. And I didn't know anything about legality or anything. So we went down to the beach in Malibu, and we got a bunch of people, and I just started filming them have sex on the beach in public. Sure. And I shoot the first scene, and the place is starting to fill up, and people are starting to point and look at us. And I guess you know, my friend said, we should get out of there. So we go to another place up in the Hollywood Hills, one of his clients. Uh, we He's dead now. But do you remember the old surfing director, Dale Davis? walk on the wet side all that stuff in the 60s like uh he produced like jan and dean jan and dean were like you know the- i know the name yeah 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 okay yeah if you're at all an old surfing director, he was one of the creators of the surfing film yeah okay. if you're google he's a very famous surf director so right. this is how i got, got going in porn so we go over there and i shoot these amateur scenes whatever uh you know um and i go drop them off and Kevin, once again, he's like, oh, these are great. I want you to shoot more. I go, no, nah, I don't want to do it. He's like, why? I go, because I lost $200 doing it. I'm not making a career out of porn. Everything I do loses money. I'm not going to make porn. And he goes, throws $500 at me. Boom, boom. He goes, now, now you've made a $300 profit. Because what he did is he took a look at the, back in those days, we'd shot at what were called chromes. You remember chromes? No. Uh, okay. You shot, let's say you shot 35 millimeter film on stills. Okay. Okay, still cameras would shoot film in those days. So we were shooting mm-hmm. 35 millimeter. Uh, the chrome is like the ones that used to do slideshows. I mean, you okay. guys young. I don't remember this thing, but they no. do this little, they'd oh, be yeah. paper and they're, you have to hold them up to a light to see them. Sure. And in the old days, your grandparents, your, your guys, the great great grandparents would play these for you. Yeah. On the wall, it'd be slideshows, but that's how they did it in the, these days. They're called crones. So you hold these pictures up to the light. He sees these people fucking on the beach because that's why he said, Go shoot me more of them. So, anyway, I went down there, shot on the beach, and ended up getting arrested. <laughs> and, uh, but back then, because porn had just become legal in 89, so they, they hit me on felony counts 
on yeah. pandering and conspiracy. Because when you arrest somebody, you know, because that goes back to the old Al Capone days, you hit conspiracy, you know, you see all that stuff. They always come kind of, conspiracy charge always triples it, right? Sure. And so that's why they, and you're teamed up with somebody. So it's worse doing a crime with other people than by yourself. So you get conspiracy and pandering is basically being a pimp because that's what they used to pop you on in the old days. So anyway, um, now I owe money to lawyers, and, you know, and basically I, I, I teamed up with uh, Dale Davis, uh, the, the old surf director where he's like, I, he would, I would get the girls, he, we would shoot them like where he would get a blow job from them. And then they do a girl, girl. And I would cut these into my movies, which were becoming the beach bum amateurs. And he would edit them and all this stuff for me. So I was getting basically free content working at his house sure. and then i ended up paying all these legal bills and you know after i you know you start getting a reputation i had people coming to me to shoot after that sure and that's where and jm was born from that that's where the whole jm thing started with the days when david lords was a salesman over there for jeff mike who worked for zane at the sure. time yeah. and then the, and this was the beginning where jeff mike found me this guy who would do anything and i became the guy that started shooting all that jm stuff Okay. And that was yeah. all the bataki's, all that shit came from that. You guys, all began. I don't, I don't know if this is a touchy subject at all, but JM eventually got hit with an obscenity charge, right? Oh, or they tried of, to? Yeah. A lot of them. We had several. We had four or five. That's fucking horrendous. Larry He's Flint involved. is like one of my heroes. Uh, yeah. Just, just because First Amendment rights, you know, you want to push. I, I, I. 100% believe in that and I believe in it with porn um, the JM stuff I was going through it just so I could try and see what I remember and what I didn't and there was uh, you know it was classic stuff we grew up uh, really man Shane's gonna be on the outside just because he doesn't know the names as much as I do but like uh, I, grew I remember up- the slits <laughs> okay okay good the band. <laughs> I grew up big on I was a, a huge fan of the uh, extreme associates line of uh dvds um we were past you know uh vhs's i don't think i ever owned a vhs did you shane uh i never purchased vhs porn but i uh boot i had a a vhs video that i i would stay home from school sick some days and then i would sneak my stepdad's porn or my dad's porn, his VHSs, and then I would take the two v- VHS or the VCRs at the same time, you know? Sure. And copy I would it over. Forward over and like an old movie I got off TBS or something. So it would say like, you know, Aladdin, but sure. it was actually, you know, like Cream Pie Queens or some shit like that. So it's funny, Jim, how you talked about how you get a reputation and it kind of just becomes a snowball going downhill. Right. We were we do a comedy show is what we do. And we got an interview with a big name from the time just by reaching out on Instagram saying, hey, we were talking to interesting people, people we found interesting. And by that, I mean, a fucking 9-11 conspiracy theorist, some (laughs) Swedish guy who talked about fucking singularities and whatever, whatever it is. We were just trying to rip on people. Uh, And we reached out to Gage, uh, who was big during that time. And she was like, yeah, sure. Gage Mojo. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll talk about her in a little bit because there's in Arkansas right now. Yes, she does. Yeah, and but again, oh, th- that was the thing. She reached out and she said, or we reached out and we said, hey, we want to interview. We did an interview. It was a great time. Grabbed a couple more people just by having a reputation of having talked to Gage, Erica, PR rep reached out. She's wonderful. Then the other PR companies reach out and you just all of a sudden you go, well, now I have a porn star interview show. Like right. it's weird how it, it kind of not necessarily the path you set out on, but it's something you become successful at because I don't know, you have the grind to do it and, and it's in your wheelhouse, right? How dictators right. are made. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. You kill one guy and you go, well, that was easy enough, right? Uh, yeah, that's what can that's, keep it going. One dissident. Yeah, well, let's fix the world now. Um, so Jim, you were known as kind of like an innovative guy in the stuff you brought to this, right? Um, can you tell us how you brought uh, Bukaki to America? All right. Okay, a lot of these <laughs> things, you understand, Jam, Jeff Mike loved shocking everybody, and I was like the perfect guy to do it for him. Because I, 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 I would just do these, you know, it was a weird era, because I like, you guys are younger, but like before you, right before DVDs came along, 
they existed before, but they took over the market in 2002. I'll never okay. forget what happened. It was like, was it, two, it was either 2002 or 2003. You, literally, you went from 90% of your sales to VHS to 20% in 30 days. This is how fast when it wow. finally took over. Oh, and, I bet I know what it was. But that it went so fast because what happens is we, before then, DVDs have been out, but they used to be made with, with what was called a glass master. Do you guys remember these terms? Not, not glass uh, master. No, I don't know that. Glass master would cost you, keep in mind, I'm talking 97, probably 98. First DVDs I remember around 97, 98, right? A glass master would cost $10,000. So there's a barrier to entry. See, there's so much porn being put out nowadays because there's no barrier to entry. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Anybody can throw it on the OnlyFans. It's free to set up this stuff. Porn in the old days, there was a serious barrier to entry, like anything. There's, it cost a lot of money to put out something. Sure, you could do the basic thing, but you got marketed. There's costs of, you know, besides your production itself, but if you're going to distribute it, then your distribution costs, knowing people, you're going to have to keep on putting on a bunch of movies, whatever. It's called a barrier to entry. Sure. So anyway, you had the DVDs with a $10,000 cost on them. The glass master said nobody, the DVD thing lagged behind and the porn companies were afraid to go full steam into it, which are usually the first ones because early adapters always buy porn, you know, when right. it comes to starting mm -hmm. technology. So, um, the porn companies were scared to jump in because they got their asses had to hand it to them prior to that in the CD-ROM craze. The CD-ROM craze came before the DVD craze. Before mm -hmm. that came the laser disc craze from the 80s. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember the laser discs. You ever hear about this yeah. one? Now, was it? Yeah. See, I, I went to school for film. And by the way, when I got enough C's in classes, plenty of uh, plenty of my teachers let me know, like, you can always just direct porn, which I now I find a little insulting to, Pretty porn, insulting, yeah. to porn people, not to me. Like, I mean, they no, you couldn't just, direct porn. They, no. no, absolutely not. I'm not talented enough. But I remember, was it VHS against Laserdisc? No, oh. it was uh, yeah, it or was. Betamax. No, it was a VHS and Betamax. It was laser yeah. disc and and I think that was might have just been a, a thing that nobody was, gave a shit about. Okay, since I it was like a, it was VHS versus Beta. Okay, okay. With, but it was the same basic type of thing. You had Beta. Sure. That's like Tesla versus any every other chart uh, uh, electric like car. Right? Yeah, right. Sure, sure. You know, it's, it's the same basic thing. It's just like. Beta was a better quality thing, but VHS marketed it better, and they took over the marketplace. V D, uh, beta was ever better. Everybody knew that. Sure. But VHS went in price of recorders, everything to the marketplace. And we can talk, talk about sell-through and all sorts of things that changed the whole game when mm -hmm. sell-through products came into being. This is – it's – yeah, because I, I look at everything we do nowadays. That's why I say the more stays – changes the more it stays the same it's all about Patterns. just putting out you know how are you going to distribute it how are you putting out the product it's the same basic shit you know, whether you're streaming it over the internet or you're putting it on you know film in the old days and putting it in theaters but, but anyway your question was when dvd vhs just got me why up wiped once out yeah they, once they found a way that's no longer the glass master's they figured out how to do it cheaper. It was like overnight when you went to just the replication runs and you're just paying your editor, the authoring guy, 800 bucks to do it. And then you're just running the replication. Everybody took their old inventory, their old catalog and stuck it on the DVD. And when it hit, it was, cause I know, cause I was started Powersville, my own line at the time, even though I owned multimedia before Notorious, which ended up in lawsuits and everything. And I shot for Jam and other companies back in those days. I started putting out my own stuff just cause I had to keep on shooting. It's a long, it's a financial reason why, but um, I was putting out this stuff and by my second or third release, like, it was all being sold on DVD. It was a crazy how fast it changed. It was one month. It just changed everything once the prices of those glass masters disappeared. Wow. It's like the old days that you know to broadcast, do streaming live. Because we were trying in those days to set up internet and everything from our company. And to be able to, you know, do a live show, you know, you know what it would cost you to have to do it from your house from the office? Wow. Right. T1 modem, right? Yeah. And how much was it a month? 
Uh, it, it, uh, 10,000. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that would be it a guess. 10,000 and 1998, $99, let's call it. Yeah. Dude, what is that now? If you today's dollars, I'm not to, you know, a hundred, like 200, a month. Yeah, nothing. No, yeah, but it's probably about $20,000 a month. Oh, now, oh for all you're streaming for free on OnlyFans. Yeah. Dude, what do you oh. think? I mean, so Sorry. there was a lot of barriers to entry back then. Right. So I mean, know how we got on this tangent, but I guess we're setting up for whatever the question was about what were you how, asking? How you brought over uh, uh, various, <laughs> various, various forms of uh, degeneracy to the U.S., such yeah. as uh, oh. Bik- Bukaki. Oh, so anyway, Jeff Mike. Yeah, what were we going to talk about? The DVDs. Okay, so here's how Bukaki began. So Jeff Mike would always kind of come up with these things, like perverted stories. I was just basically hungover. I'd been up all night. I'd left up a, like a porn set when perverted stories began and we used to spin a lot of these things would get create start in perverted stories the first bukkake was a scene in a perverted stories the gutter mouth came from perverted stories these things would be spun out of this old line called perverted stories which used what jeff mike just sent me off he goes just create something crazy one weekend to have it big you know because i was starting to get a name just make a jim powers whatever that's why i do all these things with those weird things monsters screwing people and all those crazy <laughs> people their re- heads cut off and the yeah. octopus fucking women and all these the hitchhikers and fucking sure. stumpy and all the alien when i did the alien autopsy video and they fuck it this was all within perverted <laughs> story mm-hmm. so anyway i go in his office one day and he's got this vhs from japan right and this is still in the vhs days and i he sticks he goes jim you need to see this he puts it in. I'll never forget this. And you see this girl. She's in her room, Japanese girl, wearing the Playboy with, uh, ears, right? Mm-hmm. And it's very slow and romantic, and she's just masturbating. Camera pulls out into a crowd, and she's surrounded with like 25, maybe more. It might have been 40, 40 Asian guys wearing white underwear, all of them, because it's uh, Japan. Right. And so I'm watching this thing going, what the fuck? And then all of a sudden you hear a clap and they all rise up. So you read those from a cocky. So I got second clap. They all take off their underwear. Third clap. They throw the underwear at her. They yell bukkake. And then they set her down and basically complete organized chaos, but they don't say anything because they're, you know, very much in control. It was, like, it was insane. And but no, it's very quiet. She just sits there, and they just come from either side and shoot in her face. And it was all pixelated. It had to be pixelated because uh-huh. it was Japanese. Mm-hmm. And he shows me this, and I'm like, well, "Where the fuck am I going to get all the Japanese guys?" He goes, "No, no, just get one of the guys, right?" <laughs> and, 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 and I'm like, "I'm like, fuck, you know." You know, keep in mind, you're still if they're you to do male talent, they're going to want a lot of money. Okay, so what I did is. We had this warehouse because I, you know, I had notorious at the time. And I got like, I think it was the very first Bukaki in Perverted Stories. It's an old Perverted Stories scene. I get like 17 or 18 guys. I get all the regular male town. They come over. I got I had like John Doe's in it, Dave Hardman, all those guys, Rick Masters, you sure. know, all those characters from that era are in it. If you watch the very first one. And we did it, we did it just like they did the Japanese one. And then he puts it out and it gets such a good response. He's like, Jim, we need to do it again, but it's going to do its own line. So I figure, well, what if we do it weekly and I just tell the guys, they'll start building on itself. And I learned real fast. It was going to, it was going to cap out if I was using the regular male talent. So we had to bring it to the man on the street. We needed the average Joe to come to these. That's what we had to do. And I, it was, during that era, and I think that's what started this, was that crazy era. We were all trying to outdo each other with these world record gangbangs and shit. Do you guys remember these days? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so we were all trying to, you know, when I was up against, he's dead now. I forget what his fucking name is, but uh, <laughs> uh, whatever his name is, he's dead. But like, I used to compete against <laughs> him, but I could beat his record. So if he'd have 150 people, and then I get two, have to get 200 guys. And really, maybe you'd have, I, I think I actually have most guys anyway. I actually have 150. But all you got to do is tag your put, penis into it, and it counts as one. Tag the girl and the fucker. But yeah. like the spot, 
551. Because remember, I did that candy apples busted at 742. Because I wanted to make it, which later became Warp Tour, but I had skateboarding at it, bands playing. I wanted to make it a whole event, like a, a Warp Tour, but you could beat off on the girl. <laughs> it like that with the bands. And fun, yeah. there. Sure. Anyway, so it gets back to the cocky. So we're starting to do them. In the first volume, they're starting to build them like, in the 20, you know, 25 people, 30 people. And I'm running ads because we're looking for all the guys for these, these things anyway. So I'm running ads in LA weekly. And I figured that we had to do the cockies. I started doing by bus stops because most of these guys didn't have cars. So I would, and I'd also do on Wednesday nights after they got off work. And I would also, um, could they could get tests for free and it would come off their pay. Cause that was back in the days of Eliza testing, okay. which is a very, fast 15 minute result so we had a testing facility we were using in van nuys or north hollywood or whatever it was and i would get the guys you know coming you know i was i was seeing ads physical ads in laundromats because i figured those guys needed extra money sure. and we were putting these ads in la weekly i set the bukkake hotline you know you reached the bukkake hotline and all that stuff that was me and, and <laughs> what i did is I, I started getting such you know, a big crowd coming to these things because like Larry, what's his name? Larry, uh, Melrose, Larry Green would come and broadcast it on the Howard Stern show. Right. And Howard Stern started talking about the Bukakis and the girls would do the Bukakis and they'd fly out there. Remember back in those days, you had all the porn girls on. Mm -hmm. Oh they yeah. Fly, they would fly to a show. I mean, they flew me out there. I went to the show and um, they would, they would get the, you know, everybody would come on the show and Howard Stern. So I was getting, over a hundred people at these bukkakis and I had to have a, you, you can't just do it with a normal porn set. So I would, I, the guy who was booking the girls for me was the lead at Jurassic park at universal. Okay. He had been in Jurassic okay. park. Yeah. I, yes. I hired the whole ride staff <laughs> okay. the bukkakis, and I would run these like theme park rides. So when you come there, it wasn't like a typical porn set. You'd be set up there. You close to security. They bring you to do the paperwork. Cause they're like, I mean, you know, you had guys were meeting each other, last saw each other in prison, fights would break out. We'd have security, and we had the cocky robbery where they pulled a gun or held up a guy from like ash and put a gun to his head. We had all sorts of crazy shit with take like so the cockies because they were it was just like a zoo. And these were not the normal porn guys. And you know, from this came the mope, the whole mope world, and you know, the Steve Driver, you know, the guy in the the samurai porn killer when he when he killed the people and everything that what the movie mope is about okay he all came, they came from the bukkake that was a bukkake boy um and um it was it was like shooting a sporting event much much more than a porn movie but that's how bukkake i just took it to the next level and became a part of americana you know lexicon like a word you say nobody knew what it was back then sure yeah so were you able to then keep costs down as well by grabbing more of these, I, I understand you said oh, you were, that was the whole reason. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Imagine if you had to pay a hundred porn stars, right? Yeah. Bust on a chick. Yeah. And they couldn't do it either. These guys. These guys could come really quick. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. They would listen to you, and they were basically, and they were all the dream. We were selling the dream of you're going to become a porn star, and you're going to get noticed. Sure. Most of you get noticed, all right. You didn't want to be around. <laughs> but plenty of guys actually came. You no, know, there were plenty of guys that came out of this, and it was it was such a yeah. Because we'd always have the magazines there covering these things, and you know, I, I'd have to keep away the other. I'd call them chicken hawks. So the other directors would come over there trying to steal my men because they were too cheap to put out the ads. Because the LA Weekly ads were expensive. Right. Those oh days, yeah, you know. but... and and you know, so we were paying. <laughs> I think what did start out like 50 bucks uh, a guy okay. and then it went to like 70, $75. So if you had a hundred guys, there, generous. Get, yeah. Yeah. That's so, bad. I'd do it for 10, now, 15 months, bucks. We would do the Bukakis. There'd be three per volume. Right. And so we would do them three weeks in a row. So it'd be three Wednesdays or Tuesday. What was it? Bukaki? That's been a while, and, and but we do them like three week, weeks in a row because that way they get the test and those days would be good for a month. So test one time, and remember these guys were getting, you know, hit on to become because they became like a Bukaki union guy who's trying to unionize, <laughs> and and they were being you know taken to other sets and everything because everybody wanted to do you know like I said it was a world of everybody was competing.
like like guys would do lines and want like you know they fuck the girl but they want 12 guys to blast on her face afterwards remember that old line that was out so you know the cocky turned into uh, it started getting so popular and you know next thing you know jeff mike's driving ferraris around all sorts of shit you know it's like you know, the, you know, keep in mind, he did, he did end up getting in trouble with the U.S. government over this. But um, so anyway, uh, the cocky, you know, from that we did the Gokin, which meant swallow. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like and, that one. And, yeah. and, and then we did the butt fuck the cocky. We did the lesbian the cocky. We did the reverse the cocky. Did you, you do know, the oh, Yukozuna? What's the that one? one? Is that the one they sit on your face and fart? <laughs> no, these are the cockies. No, you know, no. <laughs> Let me ask you, was the pay less uh, for the girls versus a different type of scene because there's less wear and tear on them? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I told them, well, it's not to mention, do you know what a facial would cost to actually get those people over there? <laughs> Lucky to do it. I would have girls that would be crying. We'd have to have a backup all the time. And girls would be crying if they didn't get a Bukkake. And, really? Really? And it, it will, you know, they say the semen is good for the skin. So think how much that would cost have done in your real life sure sure yeah, yeah. a nice la spa what's that gonna yeah. cost you exactly i don't know so, dude some guys down in 10 city do it for, for yeah yeah, yeah that's I, the point yeah but would you be in a safe environment i was providing a service that's a think, good point yeah yeah and so anyway i think you know like i need i did a lot of good in the world and <laughs> with my little bit <laughs> so, uh, go ahead, so would you say that uh like you mentioned how it's kind of just like all been accidental. Do you like your role in porn or are you just kind of, are you, are you like, um, kind of like me where it's like, I get home from my regular job every day and I'm like, Oh Jesus fucking Christ. I'm going to kill myself. You know? No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> okay. I, I, I said, I fell into this accidentally. Okay. Yeah. You know, Cause I wasn't like a, you know, film student that was trying to make a film and I couldn't do it. I fell into porno. So I'm angry. Those are the angry guys. The yep, angry guys there you go. Are, yep. are the artists, you know what I mean? Sure. And I mean, I've always been pretty artistic. I was originally an art major, you know, but played in a punk band or something. So I've always, you know, been creative, I guess. But I was never the angry person that felt like, oh, suck doing porn. I used to be a stockbroker. Nothing's worse than that. And, you know, back, back in the days, that you know, selling stocks on the phone, that's a nightmare. Uh, Anything, cold calling, shit like that. Oh, yeah. Ugh. Ugh. I did that for years. Um, Jim, let me ask you a question, a real basic question that Shane and I have been wondering since high school. Who or what determines who the cover girl was going to be on a DVD? No one or the company. <laughs> okay. It's simple. Uh, look, it just, okay, there's a lot of these because I, I shot so, so many different companies and there's so many different things. Some places just happen to be the best picture. Okay. And Jeff, Mike, like JM was pretty much, you know, a lot of those, just who had the best picture. He didn't care if they were popular or not. Because this is before you had a lot of that shit like, uh, but, you know, if you go back to the days before you had the analytics and everything like you do for like how many fans they have on Twitter and all this shit, before you had anything to gauge them by, um, Sure, certain girls were well known for back in those days going on the road dancing or whatever it might be, or maybe if cable would purchase that movie of them, you know, or if your foreign markets were asking. But for the most part, like the JM stuff was kind of like whoever just had the best picture if they happen to like would make the cover. Sure. But like, like because I shop all these different companies, that a lot of times it was the star girl that you you knew was going to be the cover who was. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, that's who you wanted on the cover. And it's like, there was like, it all depends on the company. Sure. You know, or there's the girl who's banging the owner of the company. You know what I mean? Or whatever. I, I was I was going to say, if, if DVDs were still prominent today, it would probably be whoever has the highest follower count or sure. best picture, like you said, or if it was a specific niche you were going for. Um, well, I would even in the 90s, look at I, I shot a lot of stuff for, with, you know, the Spice Channel, because that's really when I started going because I'm the, was one of the early guys shooting Spice, and like by '95, I was doing all those features on Spice and stuff. You know, um, I was always also asking when we would shoot a movie, and they would tell me sometimes, "Can you get this girl in the movie? We really want her because our Germ- Germany wants this girl in the movie." 
sure. or, you know, or, you know, some of the bigger paying companies, countries like Germany was always the holy grail of the companies to get because they paid the most, you know what I mean? Uh, and so you'd listen to what Germany had to say. Or, the, you know, if you were already shooting for a cable company, you already had a locked-in deal. Uh, but, um, yeah, you would, you would just kind of go with who the popular girl is. I would, you, you would do try to do that. We, I was always trying to, every movie, I've always tried to stake out somebody that's going to be popular that could be your cover. Sure. Or a, or a really good-looking new up-and-coming girl. Okay. Okay. That made sense. Um, you, I have loved for years um, on Pornhub – your porn's uh oh what was it specifically called porn's most outrageous outtakes go on they were yeah. some of my favorite things ever I, I just i don't know why i like behind the scenes stuff but i also like the realism of just behind i don't necessarily need to see someone fucking i really like watching tanner mays lose her fucking mind on set um was that your that was biggest freak one. out? Yeah, that was a real good one. Was that the biggest freak out you had uh, from a female performer, or is this something you couldn't maybe put in there? Or I've had back in the okay, it was a different era. Let totally. Just, let me. I used to get <laughs> Jeff, Mike. Wait, here's what people didn't realize in those days: I would get bonuses if you went and complained about me, okay. and that was it. Was a different era. Think about what I just said. That's insanity nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, it sure is. And it wasn't like I was supposed to be mean to people, but is it pushing them to get the best he could of what he wanted to see? Right. And that was basically my job, you know, was to push people because Jeff Mike loved those freak out moments and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's so like, even if you watch the Tanner Maze one, it's so stupid because you see, I'm, I'm in there. He's like, they come up to me and the guy's a BTS guy's still I'm eating a sandwich. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah, because half the time these things would happen, and we, I've got, I've, I could tell set stories forever, but usually I would just kind of be like the innocent idiot just saying there, what the fuck just happened? You know what I mean? Type of thing. You know, like all these just shooting and this chaos is erupting around you, whether it's a guy running around with a gun or somebody getting beat up, or, you know, the shit that just happens. Somebody's mm-hmm. flying through a window. You know, this shit would happen, you know, would happen. Yeah, but Tanner, that was a good one just because it went on so long. It was so ridiculous. The best part of that whole thing is when she gets in the taxi. It shows you how old it is. There's a taxi. Mm-hmm. She leans out and says, does anybody know my address? <laughs> yeah. uh, yep. Yep. I, I do. I like that one a lot. Um, <laughs> it, it, okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you to rake your mind this late at night, but Give me a good onset story where a performer where where maybe you thought again you said your job was to push a little bit and uh, again different era where was something where you pushed and then maybe you went oh shit did I push too far on this? <sighs> a lot of times we used to do a line called the Violation Series. Do you remember that? Ooh, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. Yep, later on. Yep. The Violation had a lot of those and. Look, my job was to do the thing. You know, they want you need an X number of uh, amount of footage. I had to deliver this for the companies, and and we tell people ahead of time. Look, I got to shoot this much footage, and you know how it's once you're in the moment. I, I learned that the girls would kind of go overboard when the girls would get in that system when they're like assaulting one of the girls. Girls can be really mean, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and these girls don't really realize what they would get into. You know what I mean? And a lot of times we get these girls who are kind of prima donnas, and we pay to be in these things. And all the other girls who are you know our regulars and stuff would kind of you know took it as a class struggle type of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> really, you know, to be brutal when they're shoving the dildos on her. So I had a lot of those type of ones where you had somebody like. Three or four times I have to keep on talking you back onto the set. Well, that goddamn bitch out there, you know, you have to start. And there'd be fights. I mean, I, I've been shooting scenes. I was doing a lesbian orgy one time. These two girls hated each other. And one girl was trying to impale the other one with a dildo in the middle of the thing. And I'm shooting a big beta cam. And I'm trying to separate these girls from fighting with my legs in the middle of them while I'm still trying to shoot the rest <laughs> of Ten girls in the room. And they're literally trying to kill each other in the middle of the room. But, um, I don't know. I mean, it's like you'd have to. There's just so many of those. It was sure. like it was, it was commonplace. It was like, I mean, things like that. I mean, I mean, uh, 
I mean, there's so many crazy stories I can tell, like drug induced stories of things that did happen in sets that were fun, but funny. Where you know, I got literally this guy lost his mind, like because like idiot. I didn't know what he did at the time. I found out later, but he went sm smoked. Do you guys remember when um, glass was around? Yeah, I mean, yes, I've never smoked glass. Accidentally like, smoked PCP one time, but no, not glass. Okay. Yeah, an idiot smoked it. And it's like a movie and. He's running, like, I'm trying to do the scene with him. Like, there's something wrong with his eyes. I didn't know what it was at the time. So. <laughs> and he's going to get hard. Or he's just doing, he's doing the meth twist you know, death <laughs> on it, the twist. And yeah, anyway, the, the other, I have the other talent just get him through the scene, forget the DP. And it was, I was doing an Amish movie called, um, I do a lot of Amish movies for some reason, where we, everybody be in Ordnungs and you'd go to the Ordnung. And and I'd like you know the black guy would go hide out in the Amish community, or the black girl would go hide out. So I do these Amish movies, which were quite popular at the time. I don't know why. You know, Kingpin was out and stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. so anyway, this guy goes and smokes this uh, setting. We're shooting up in the hills of Valencia where we're gonna do this movie. And I get this cool location and when I get there that morning, the owner says the kid whose mom owned the house, he goes, Look at my sister, I'm trying to get her out of the house. I go, what's your sister doing here? Yeah, I go, well, how's your sister? He goes, she's 14. I go, she's got to get the fuck out of here. I'm showing up to shoot a porn. You can't have a... And she's got a fucking prisoner boyfriend. These are the classic guys straight out. Of all the prison tattoos, shaved head, like the Aryan type of guy. You know what I mean? Straight out of the like, oh. Aryan right? Whatever it is. And, and uh, the Aryan Brotherhood. I'm like, straight up, this Nazi low rider type of guy. And I'm like, what the fuck? He goes, well, can you give her some money to go to the mall? Whatever. So I give them some money so they take off to the mall. Because that sets up. So we're trying to get the movie done fast. Very simple Amish porno we want to make. Everybody's dressed up like Amish people. we got the beard smoked on the guys, right? And we're going to gangbang a girl later that day and do a DP scene. And uh, I think that was just it. It was a little gangbang and a DP. So... My star male talent ends up smoking ice in, you know, not, not telling us. And he's so high, so we can't do the scenes. So I just shoot it with the other guy, and he's just hanging around the set. He won't leave. And he can't <laughs> come. And he's on ice. And, and the makeup artists are pushing him away with a pitchfork away from the makeup because he keeps on running over going, because he's doing the twist, thinking he's going to come, but he can't come because he's numb from the ice. And, I'll, and I'm, I'm just trying to shoot the movie. I go, just sit, you know, because he can't drive. So we're just going, get in your car. You got to get out of here, right? But you can't get out of here. We know that. So just sit in your car. He doesn't. <laughs> so now we're doing this blow bang. He keeps on coming in. They're shoving him out. That, uh, that was just funny. You can actually see the movie. It's called Homie in the Haystack. Why they say <laughs> Brother Jedediah has lost his mind. And the guy uh -huh. comes around the background. They're shoving him out of there. It's called Homie in the Haystack. And so anyway... Then what happens is we hear that the girls, the guys come back. We're on the property outside the house now, and we've heard that they've come back. They're sick. Which they want us out of there. And he sees that I have all these black people there because we're doing a gangbang and mm -hmm. stuff. Uh -huh. And he's going to kill us. And so now everybody's, I'm trying to get through the pop shop, right? This idiot keeps on running around on the on the ice. I'm trying to get the get the pop shot, the last shot after we gangbang this girl, right? And everybody's grabbing pitchforks and knives and everything in case the guy comes out to you know, fight him to we get the pop shot. So everybody's lining up for a war. And I get the pop shot and she goes running to the hill yelling, I'm an Amish whore and I love it. And it's very surreal because it's like it's all of a sudden the storm was gonna hit. And and then we hear sirens. It was all going on we're up in the woods. Like, what the fuck is going on? We're wrapped. Get the fuck out of here. Because we're shooting outside. So we'd already wrapped the inside. Uh -huh. And I was just trying to get the pop shot. We're hopping in the car. And I still see the guy trying to twist and jerk, jerk off. <laughs> he's jerking off now. But, oh, he's walking around. And blood is pouring down his hand. But what is his nail? Oh. just breaking right there. Right? Oh. So anyway, we leave. Right? And... I would go, you got to get out of here. Get out of here. Make him just get in his car. Just get off the property. Because, you know, before some of this guy starts shooting people. So anyway, we leave. And the, and the next morning, I, you know, you wanted a good set story. Mm -hmm. It's 8 o'clock the next morning. I get this phone call. Chap, he's whispering on the phone. I'm like, yeah. He goes, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, you did? And he goes, yeah. He goes, 
thing. He goes, man, don't ever do ice. I go, yeah, no shit. <laughs> right. He goes, yeah, that was horrible. He goes, I, it took me six hours to get home. And we were done shooting. It was still, it was probably like eight o'clock in the summer. So he said he got home like around two in the morning because he had to keep on pulling over because and tr trying to jerk off all the way home. <laughs> And he couldn't do it. So it took him like hours to get out of the hills of Valencia to get back to Chatsworth, wherever the hell he lived. And, and so anyhow, he told me, yeah, I finally came this morning and just to make sure it worked. I jerked off again, right? And I'm like, oh, God. He goes, he goes, but I need you to do me a favor. I'm like, what? He goes, you need to call Chuck Martino. I'm like, why? He goes, well, I have to shoot for him today. I go, why don't you call him? It's your gig. He goes, well, he's your friend. He goes, I don't have any skin left on my dick. He born his whole dick off as a bloody stump. <laughs> like, well, why don't you just call Chuck and explain? He'll understand. He knows you. Just you call him. I'm not going to call him for you. That's ridiculous. You know, then it sounds stupid when a director does that. I go, you're better off just calling him yourself and saying yeah. something. But anyway, that's a don't do ice. I mean, that's the <laughs> uh -huh. Is it... Uh... <laughs> Is it a lot easier shooting nowadays than back then in terms of the professionalism of the people on set? Or are there still time? Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. Well, the difference nowadays is we have, we really can't do a lot of that stuff anymore. And let's face it, it's because of Twitter, social media, and stuff like that. But back in the old days, I mean, look, I'm the guy who used to get sent by Playboy to make those party videos. Sure. I used to do Kelly the co-ed. You've seen all that stuff. Yes, I have. Yeah. I would be, and there were 200 drunken frat guys shooting scenes. I did that for a decade. So you can't, you just can't make that stuff anymore. So you, we're in a different world now. Like that, I mean, it was kind of weird. That stuff kind of peaked out and ended, what, in 2009, 10, 11, 12, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. I forget when I was shooting for Playboy doing all that stuff, but you just can't do that anymore. You know, old girls got wild stuff and all that crazy stuff we used to do. Sure. Because, the, you know, now, you know, people, you know, you know, it's just, you know, it's the world's changed. I think in a lot of ways. You, I watch the old jam stuff. I'm like, God, you can't make that anymore. Like Girlvert. Sure. You can't make that. So I had a question that kind of relates back to old stuff uh, versus newer stuff. All the girls we've interviewed, we've probably interviewed 50 performers at this point, if not more. Um, it, they, all right. Okay. One of my favorite things are a lot of the behind the scenes stuff where you will just randomly get the big star of the show, the, the movie, whatever it is, uh, fluffing the guy a little bit. Girls don't do that anymore from the ones we've talked to. They're just not interested in it. They're not, they're like, there's more of a level of professionalism it feels like but it's a little bit less fun to me Wait a bit. okay they say a lot of that stuff but you know, i mean i shoot porn all day and you get the girls when they're nine out of ten girls when they're alone they're doing they say they're doing a scene with the guy or whatever and he's having any sort of trouble they tend to help mm -hmm. keep in mind when you say they're a big star chances are they're telling us what guy they want to do too. Okay. So, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, they, 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 I thought about that too. Like I, I, cause Matt's made that point a few times, I think. And, and I, um, I mentioned that to my wife and she's like, no, I'll jerk off any guy. Like, you know, if he's about to fuck me and I was like, okay, yeah, that, it just, it just kind of seems like womanly etiquette. Like it just seems yeah. like it, if the dick's going in you anyway, you just crank it up a few times, you know, you know, <laughs> Go ahead. The best porn girls, the, poor, the best porn girls realize if they act like they like that guy and they're nice to him, they were they're going to whip right through that scene so fast it's going to be easy. True. The ones that act like cunts, <laughs> do you really want to sit there and be a bitch while the guy's flailing around trying to get his dick hard because you're such a bitch? Right, right. Yeah, and then he's going to have to drill you with it. Yeah, the best porn girls are the ones that make it easy on the guy and sail you right through, and those are the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you right now. From experience, the girls, the bigger they are, the, be the better they try to make that guy get through the scene. Okay. Mm, they're, fair enough. They're, not, they're not bitches to him. They're not. I, I, I didn't make that up, Shane. You made it sound like Matt made this assertion. We, no, no, I mean, no, we, I we've just, asked them. We, we've heard. We, yeah, no, but I'm I'm saying like it does seem they're liars. like. They're okay. liars. Yeah, like everyone we've interviewed is just talking a big game, basically. Fair yeah. enough. Well, look, no, look, I don't know if it's a big game. Look, everybody's had those situations, I think, where girls don't want it because they don't like that guy or whatever it might be. Mm. Everybody's going to have one. These girls do hundreds and hundreds of scenes. 
Sure. Right? So you're always, and everybody remembers the, the bad scene versus all the ones that just went by, right? It's just human nature. Right. right? We complain about a restaurant more than we rave about it, correct? If you have a bad experience at Burger King, you're going to tell everybody. But That's you're not going to tell one yeah. that Whopper perfect. You don't tell everybody they're Burger King. Right. So I, I think, you know, the, getting back to, I, I just think that the most important girls, Look, a guy that, yes, if the guy is just floundering and can't do it, we just cut the scene. We get another guy in there. He just can't do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, that I get. But if you're just talking about a guy who just needs a little bit of work, you know, talking dirty in his ear, most girls will do that because well, they're supposed to be working with that guy anyway. Sure. And they tend to be, they're good with it. I mean, sure. I, I don't get too many girls that are really that bad because when they're like that, nobody's going to want to work with them. Sure. Think about sure. that for a second. It's I get, harder for us as a director to find the guys than to find the girls. And that's just making their day longer too. You know, it's, it's just, it's, just it's, infinitely longer. Yeah. This um, business, and I'll repeat that, it's harder to find the guys than these girls. Okay. Yeah, and you can have any of them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it, it's, it's, it's like most, any good looking girl you know, not that any girl can do it, but you know what I mean. If you got a vagina, you all you do is throw on some lube and you're fine. Yeah, a guy's got to get it hard. Sure, sure. So, yeah, and stay hard. Sense. Um, Shane, I have two more questions. I don't want to interrupt you though. You got anything else for Jim tonight? Um, just our regular questions, but those are for females usually. I normally ask all our female guests, "Hey, like you like getting pissed on?" But I, I'll spare you. Thank well, you. Jim is the the are you the creator or were you just the director of the majority of the Liquid Gold series? Liquid Gold, what it was is I would shoot the girls like just because back then I'd just shoot whatever. If they wanted to pee, I'd film a pee. And Jeff might kept on seeing all this footage of the piss stuff. And he was doing all this mail order and people were asking, Do you have pee video? So he take started taking those clips from the BTS. And then it became a thing when we shoot the jam girl, they'd also film a pee. So yeah, I would shoot all that pee stuff. But usually it was like Jeff Mike, it was like little, but part of if you were hired to be in gutter mouths or whatever, pick your movie, I would chances are film me a pee because he wanted the peeing thing. And we'd always try to do something funny if we could. Sure. There was a period of time, and I don't know when it was, um early two thousands, somewhere when the piss videos were so popular. I and remember. I Itty bitty titty uh, bed wetters. Uh, uh, I used to do all these les peons. I used to do all these uh, the pee stone cops. I used to do all sorts of nothing but videos about pissing. You know, there'd be sex, but they always pee. Sure. So I made tons of piss videos for a few years. It was just nonstop. Right. I think, uh, Matt, the first time you showed me a picture of Gage, it was her spreading and taking a piss out in the middle of a of a parking lot or something may have been yeah i don't yeah, real dirty I don't quite recall yeah yeah i used to shoot gauge a lot i mean i filmed her pee a lot the first <laughs> time I, I shot her i did a scene where she's this guy's imagining she's in a room and she's imagining that this vagina is a man's climbing out of her vagina or something or it was an old babysitter scene and we had this huge fake prosthetic vagina made. And I had a guy shoved himself through it, covered in lube, like he's coming through the vagina. So it was Gage. I remember it was Gage did the scene. It was the first time I ever shot her. You a David Cronenberg fan at all? Cronenberg <laughs> uh, did what movies? He did uh, The Fly, Fly. Videodrome. Oh, my God. Scanners. Okay. Yeah, I saw those. Okay. Okay. Um, so I got, I got two more questions here for you. Um, I notice you recent, I've been looking at your recent releases. It seems like you shoot a lot of uh, trans and buy stuff as well nowadays. Yeah. Um, is that a preference of yours? Do you like shooting that better? Is it that you see the trend is moving that way? And when did you first notice how, because there was definitely a shift to make it become much more mainstream, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, I remember interviews with girls a while ago that wouldn't work with some guys who had shot um, gay scenes or with trans uh, performers or anything like that. And now it just seems like some of the biggest stars, you know, Anna Fox, who I love and I think is a superstar, you know, nominated, I believe, for shooting with trans performers and um, it's become accepted in more of the mainstream. Is that just a trend you jumped on? Do you like shooting that type of work more now than other stuff or? 
Yeah, it's um, I think one okay. Why did I, I started doing? Yeah, I did see it. Some, so it was gonna. It, I could see that was gonna something. I didn't think it was gonna go as big as it did. And when I was given the opportunity by a friend of mine who'd been doing it, and he, I was like, because I tried it back in the nineties. I did it very short period, um, and. Yeah, it was one of those things that you could see it was starting to develop. And it's look, at those are fun to shoot. It's like a lot of this stuff, it's like right now, it's like that's a little bit, shooting some of that stuff is a little bit more like the Wild West bit where you have a little more freedom on what you can do and stuff than mm -hmm. not as pigeonholed as you used to be. But even that's turning more and more mainstream now. Sure, for sure, yeah. I, I and, mean, and, yeah. And, and it was natural, and like the buy stuff just fell out. Once you start doing the trans, you can get into that buy world shooting it, and which has always been around porn. You know, I mean, this mm. stuff goes back to the 80s. Remember the old switch hitters and all those old lines and stuff, and buy and beyond and stuff, Paul Norman. Yeah, Shane's so, dad had a lot of those movies. I didn't. I, you know? I was actually going to say, yeah, like the tranny stuff's been popular with trans. my fucking my dad, like our chicks with dicks. That's what my yeah. dad always called them. He, my dad's been into that shit since the, the 90s at least. Yeah, well, back then we were calling it, yeah, it was still chicks with dicks, but it was the she males. Was oh, she males. That's yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but it was, that's another one that changed so fast because of what you went and then you shifted into the tranny and then trans was like overnight. It was that fast mm -hmm. to switch. It was kind of like switching to DVD. It was like within like a two year period, we went from doing, you know, tranny prostitutes, tranny babysitters, uh, menage a tranny, my, um, no, what's that? My world's best tranny, or whatever I would do. Uh, America's top tranny, um, um, tranny cheerleaders. They all those lines don't exist anymore. But it turned into my volume two was Menage of Trans, which didn't <laughs> rhyme as well. But um, yeah, that that was a it was a fast shift. Sure, yeah, you know, sure. And know. is do you do you shoot trans stuff any differently? Do you shoot it more like in in sure. a feminine way? Oh, okay, no, okay, nope. You just I, one thing I started, all up I, in there. I no, I just do it the same way that you do anything. Okay, it, like um, I mean, it's just it, I don't shoot any different. I mean, obviously, it's difference is you're doing something a little bit different, right? Sure. But as far as the stories or anything like that, yeah, I, I think a little bit. Obviously, you tune it to a different market. But I still shoot it the same way. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, still designed to titillate or whatever, whether you're shooting a lesbian scene, a bi scene, trans scene, straight scene, anal scene, gangbang scene. I mean, they're all different genres. Mm -hmm. I mean, like porn's weird. Like if you're in it to make when you're working within it, there's all sorts of undercurrents, things that you probably don't notice outside of unless you're doing it like all of a sudden everybody wants babysitters so or you go through the anal days or like I said, the crazy gang bang. I mean, the, the best time, craziest time I thought porn was late nineties, the late nineties, early two thousands was just such a crazy era. I mean, for everything, just because everybody was trying to one up each other. Sure. I mean, that was the era like, you know, girls would be shooting fire out of their ass. I'm not making this up. That was one of the things <laughs> They would do. They would try to, you know, one up each other all the time. You know, the Mila, you know, the prolapsed asshole, the blasting mm. pain out of the ass. We used to load up uh, the the dyed milk up their butts and you know, do lines like anal felching, you know, you know, horrors and all these lines where you'd be ass blasting and stuff, which isn't too common right now. But now we're in this whole squirt thing. Everyone's squirting scenes. Sure. Like, you know, squirting is really funny, but yeah, yeah, like a, it's kind of mainstream. You have a lot of things that don't always seem to click, like free use that goes on, and Ahiego, and all these different little things are going on all the time. But porn is kind of funny because, like, stuff in the 90s, like, I used to shoot a lot of black on black, and you don't shoot, a, I don't shoot a lot of that sure. anymore. Yeah. It, it's, you, you know, in, in the 90s, I, I, that was mostly what I did. Yeah. People forget Went on and yeah, all those names like Mimo Nasty, Cool Breeze G, Sweet Daddy J. You know, I would do all that heat wave stuff. Like every movie that would come out, like Baby Boy, I would make Baby Girl, uh, you know, Drinking Hood, uh, you know, Fridays, all those movies. Uh, you know, you name the movie, I did a parody of it. Sure. Yeah. You know, Get Your Ass on the Bus. You remember sure. that one? Yes. Yeah, so I would do, yeah. I'd do every Spike Lee movie that came out. Okay. Nice. All right. I yeah, yeah, that. But you don't do that. So that's another thing that's kind of you don't but i don't see anybody doing that anymore 
<sighs> you don't really see much of the black. It's all interracial. It's got to be white girl, black guy, or you got the white guy, black girl. Sure. You don't a lot of just black on black as a sales thing anymore. I don't see it. Hmm. I wonder if it has to do with demographics. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. Well, I don't well, know. That's a, porn has currents that are like always like you're you're doing like, like gang bangs will get real popular one year. Everybody wants to gang bangs or blow bangs. Blow bangs are really in right now. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Everybody sure. wants a blow bang. Um. All right. One last question. Then I want to run through that list of girls. See what you remember. What you don't. Uh. My question here is. And I think I know one specifically, but maybe not. Did you take any female? You were a prolific director. You still are a prolific director. Uh, did you take any female performers under your wing in terms of directing, in terms of teaching directing or anything like that? Well, probably Grover, because Ashley needs to work together all the time. That's, that's who I was thinking Ashley Blue was, was yeah. the one that stands out to me, but I didn't know if there was anyone else. Like, Did you have girls that would come in and shoot a scene, but then also ask you behind the camera questions? Or Yeah, plenty of them. Like, sure. Remember when I was at Sin City, we'd always have all those contract girls. Okay. And like a lot of them like, would have movies, and I would be their basically ghost director shooting the camera for them. You know, so God, I did. Remember Tori Lane? I did. Oh my God, what was her? What's their names? I forgot all their names. Uh, Aurora Snow. Sure. Uh, ah. God, who were some of the other ones? Um, what was the one from New York? What her name? She mm -hmm. did a big uh, cream pie movie. Well, she was real wild. And, like she went to Europe, and like seventy guys came in her ass. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. I'm thinking. I was thinking of your fifty guy cream pie movie. Was was that Jennifer, oh, Jennifer White? White. That was Jennifer yeah, White. right, right. Now, yeah, I don't know the seventy guys in the ass one. Um, hmm, I don't know. But I mean, were you were you willing to give that kind of you know? Always. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Because anybody says anything, I I help, I help them. I picture nowadays, you know, with the proliferation of OnlyFans and everything else, that there's so many girls who I mean. They're performers we talk to who are seem like they're primarily in front of the camera and know so much about behind it as well because they're shooting it themselves, lighting scenes and all the yeah. shit I paid forty grand to go to film school for. Um, I should have just done porn. Um, you all right. should have just let people fuck you in the ass for, for <laughs> yeah. twelve years. Yeah, and Seven, pick seventy it up guys in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna shut my camera down here because I'm gonna yeah. change the background. So this is my list of the top ten girls of the early-ish two thousands, probably goes up to two thousand ten. If you remember any stories about them, anything like that, recall how they were as a performer. I made sure to grab mostly girls who are out of the industry, just because you don't want to step on any toes. Not looking sure. for any negative stories but if there is one and you're willing to say it hey that's fine um positive stories are good too number 10 on my list was did that change oh really i don't see anything yeah there we go jalen fox do you remember anything about jalen i also made sure to make uh to to that you had directed them in scenes yeah i shot her a few times actually a bunch of times um, I remember that Jalen. I think she was circa two thousand nine ish, ten, right? When sure. was she around? Yep, I believe so. Yeah, she was kind of the later towards the very ending of the Bukakis and stuff. She was one of the last ones. I just remember because we used to do a bunch of stuff with Porno Dan with her. Okay, where she did like a lot of the fucking fans. She did all that Porno Dan stuff. So I do remember. I remember her, Jalen Fox. Um. I do. God, I, you know, a lot of this stuff, if you remind me of some movie and started talking to me, a bunch of stuff would probably pop into my head. Sure. So I really don't have anything good or totally bad fair. to say. I, I just remember she was really, you know, she was a wild, you know, she was one of the classic, like, she was doing Gokin or whatever, she was a cock hound. Okay. I mean, what, what, <laughs> I'd have to look at the scene. What was this a good Gokin scene? Do you remember which one it was? Six, I believe. And doing it do you remember what the scenario was no i do she not. drank a lot of cum i think she does she have goggles on maybe they I all know. did i don't know we did different things all the time i was all we were i was always jumping the shark sure. i mean we cooked the cum mm -hmm. I, we used to cook the cum that's most disgusting in the world cooking 80 loads of cum you know what that smells like it cooks uh, like 
<laughs> yeah, not pleasant, I'd assume. Um, let me say, I'm yeah, looking people, at a scene. I do remember her as being really wild. I don't really have a medical I, scene, I it looks like. I know she was a very fun girl. Okay, okay. All right, fair enough. Uh, number nine here, I would consider probably my favorite dirty talker in terms of piggishness, and that's a compliment. Okay. Was Kelly Wells? Oh, quite well, quite well. I shot Kelly a bundle of times. Kelly was like, she just loved. Okay, she's from that era when they. It was a very lot of choking and beating and slapping and, the, <laughs> and, and you know the grabbing the heels, the face fucking, the anal, just cast them out. Right, before, right before porn collapsed, she's <laughs> when it was just. Your red light, everybody in the world was throwing on DVDs as fast as they could. Like it was like the end of the Roman Empire era. So I used to shoot her a lot. She was like, I used to shoot Cameron for Skeeter. And she was one of his favorites. But yeah, I shot Kelly a zillion times. She sure. was great. Wild. Yeah. That, that that's and you'll notice a trend in in my favorites here. Yeah. It's um not this is not an insult, obviously. They're on my top ten list. Not a conventionally um, attractive face. Attractive is the wrong word there. You'll see by the time we get to number one. How do I say this? Just stick with the conventional. Just not, not a convention. Not conventional looks, but I well, really. Well, both girls were really. You know, yeah, and they're for their girls cut from that era. Sure. Is what yep. But that's how they had to be in that era. It's like you conform to whatever era you're in. For sure. And these are girls that would eat girls today alive. I get it, but that's because the era they're from. Sure. So then the, look at the type of stuff. Tough love. I mean, that was the most brutal series ever made. Sure. Yeah. It was like basically rape. You know, if you think about it, it was just <laughs> I mean, that's what it was. Uh, number eight on my list here, Taylor Rain. <laughs> yeah, quite well. <laughs> Taylor's funny. Ta Taylor was buddies with Ashley. That was one of her best friends. Mm -hmm. And then Taylor started dating Ashley's old boyfriend, uh, Trent, uh, if you, if you remember, uh, after they broke up, Taylor was then dating him and everything. Uh, she, she was, she was hilarious. Taylor was funny. She was, she became a realtor, didn't she? Whatever happened to her? I, you know, I, I, I <laughs> try and limit myself from following it after the fact. That's when you, for me personally, you're involved in the industry. If I start looking up real names and what they did after the fact that, that, Borders and starts restraining feelings. orders. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 not quite. Yeah, I, I just, I, just, I mean, that's I remember the last I'd ever heard of her, but Taylor was funny. That was one of Ashley's buddies. I, just, sure. I must have shot her thirty times. She was sure. always on the set. With Ashley, she was always hanging out with Ashley. She just hang out on set all the time. Okay. So she was always around us. Okay. She was cool. She was funny as fuck. This girl could tell stories. There you go. I, I do remember. I remember one time she was on the set because she was going to be doing a movie with. It was either De Niro or Pacino. I forget which one it was. I go, really? I go, do you have any lines? She goes, well, I only have 40 lines of dialogue. I go, you have 40 lines of dialogue with De Niro. So I, I don't know what movie this was. But anyway, that was, I remember it's in an interview, by the way. I actually interviewed her because she was in that movie, I think. Do you remember Cockstar? Yeah, I believe Cockstar, so. We would take these girls and we would interview them and just let them say the most ridiculous things. And we were trying to find the girls that were just like, <laughs> that were just ridiculous. You know what I mean? And she was one of them. Taylor was great. She was funny. Next. Okay. Next. Number seven, Kayla Marie. Yeah, I shot her. Uh... <laughs> that, that, that seemed either like you don't remember her or you do. And... I, I, I don't. Kayla's another one. She look a lot of times if you don't really remember the girls because they did their job and they were good. Fair you enough. Either really remember because they're really you couldn't stand them or they were really good. Fair and enough. Kayla was always around. That's why I, I totally remember Taylor Rain. Kayla Marie, I remember the face. We shot her a lot. She was a regular. Yeah, you know, gotcha. she was good. You know, I don't really remember much about her. Gotcha. Fair enough. Number six, still in the industry, Gianna Michaels. I didn't shoot her that much. She was ridiculously popular, though, and she was really good. She's still in, is she still around. She is. I think she does a lot of uh, more the individual like OnlyFans yeah, only and fans. and night flirt or tech whatever they are. Those things. 
blew up fast and literally was unbookable like within a year. So I didn't shoot her a lot. I mean, sure. I shot her a couple of times. That was it. Because she got really, really popular fast. And she, it was just too hard to book her. I went maybe eight years ago. Gianna Michaels and Sophie D were feature dancing. And <laughs> yeah, they were feature dancing close to us. So my friend drove me about 40 miles out or 40 minutes out. And I got so pissed drunk. I mean, just embarrassingly drunk. The bartender was cute. She had this fucking, what is it called, Shane? You hate it? Rockabilly look. And I just kept handing her 20s. Hey, give me another drink. Give me another drink. Give me another drink. By the end of the night. Now, Sophie also appeared to be consuming something as well. Oh, uh, Sophie was a drinker. Sophie uh, used to get hammered. Yeah, she would have been on this list, but I wanted to ask you more about the people that aren't. Because Sophie, I mean, seems like she's really blown up even more. Um, Sophie's doing really well. She lives in uh, Vegas. And sure. Like I said, she doesn't do porn anymore, but she dances and does her own thing, you know, private work. But she's doing really well, as far as I know. So by the end of the night, uh, I am there just pissed drunk at the bar, my head like this. And across from me is Sophie D doing the same exact thing. And we're both just, I mean, face is melting, you know, uh, and, and my friend is saying, hey, we got to leave. We got to leave. I said, hey, just a minute. We're looking at each other like apes who had never seen this species before. And we're just trying to analyze, is this something like me or is this in a different genus? Um, and I had singles splayed out all over the bar and she very drunkenly, but professionally takes the Bud Light bucket she had and puts it next to the bar, slams it against it, like kind of, uh, and just takes all of my singles and loads them into her bucket and then lays face down on the bar. And I went, time to go. When I turned around and I left. It was good. I actually got kicked out that night, so I don't know what happened between that and leaving. But yes, uh, that is my Sophie D story. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go to number five real quick. We're almost done. Oh, you're Heather's, covering the girls. You're I'm not trying girl. to. Hey, hey, hey. I heard you. I got it. I don't know what to do. There's a fucking camera here. What do you want from me? Oh, fuck. You can All still right. see the name. Paris yeah. slash Heather Gables. I remember she changed her name at one point when the Paris Hilton thing started breaking big. Well, yeah, she had a different name, didn't she, when she was with uh, Extreme or whatever? They renamed her or something? Uh, yeah, I think, again, I think it went to Paris after that. Yeah. Um, remember I, her at I, all? I, I her all the time. I totally remember her. She's, in fact, I spoke to her last year. I think really? somehow somebody was talking to her on the phone and they called up, Hey, you want to say hi to Heather? I forget who it was. Captain Tush. It was male talent. Some male talent on the set hung out with her. She lives in Florida and put her on the phone with me. And I actually ran into her at ABN like probably seven years ago or something. So she's still kind of around. She does stuff in Florida. I don't know what she does. Okay, fair You're enough. Kind of picture. Oh, do you? Yeah, I don't. Uh, trust me, the the audience isn't going to see it anyway. It's just because I wanted to give you a visual representation of but who I'm talking great. about here. Yeah, okay, she was another one of Ashley's buddies. She's from that whole era of girl vert, and we used to shoot her all the time. Sure, you know, she was a regular. Okay, number four. Let me see if I can move. Tiffany Holiday. Remember well, her? Or she had a boyfriend or something. I remember. Um, I can't see what I shot her. What did I shoot her in? Oh, let's see. Uh, Gag Factor Seventeen. The Babysitter Twenty. God, I'm sure I remember the same thing. Yeah, I remember Tiffany Holiday. Uh, it's another one. I, I remember she's from that era. I shot her. Sure. I just remember she had some boyfriend or somebody, some boyfriend or something, buddy I knew that she was dating. That's all I really remember about her. She, I think, had my favorite, again, who gives a shit, my favorite nipples of all time, personally, and areola. There you go. That's all a little fun fact about <laughs> me. Uh, uh, put that on your fucking tombstone. Yeah, man. yeah. Uh, number three on my list, uh, Gage, obviously. We've talked uh, about her before. Gage. Last was act. Great Gage we got in the business. She had a boyfriend named Mojo. Obviously, they broke up or whatever. But you know, Gage was a character. She was like this southern girl. It was just wild. 
she was like the queen of squirting and pissing and everything, wasn't she? Yeah, uh, <laughs> she was up there. Yeah, she told yeah. us on the podcast. Actually, the first time she had ever told it, I guess publicly, she told us at least how she got her name, and it was when she was dancing and the guy some i don't know some shit kicking hillbilly in arkansas or somewhere said damn you're like a 12 gauge shotgun and she said there's my name gauge jumped up on the yeah, stage there it was. your boyfriend was mojo <laughs> gauge and mojo husband, was. That's how I met them. <laughs> the first time <laughs> number two again not a lot of scenes so you may not know her as well it was cammy andrews Oh my God, I shot Cammy Andrews a zillion times. Did you? Cammy Andrews, because um, you just have the stuff, my name. I used to shoot under a bunch of different names back okay. then. Look at Jim, they didn't want to dilute the market in those days in this different world. So each company I shot for had a different director name. I shot for, I was a Stiv, um, Stiv Baders or Stiv Gators, I call myself, when I shot for Coast to Coast. I remember Stiv Baders from the Dead Boys, uh, Lords of the New Church. Anyway, that's who I was over there. And I used to shoot her like I'd go over by names like IP freely and stuff. And I she used to do a lot of the P videos and stuff. So I used to shoot her for Film Co. a lot in a lot of these other companies. I shot Cami a zillion times. I just loved how again beautiful but unconventional and just dirty. I mean, you know. She was great. You know, Cammy yeah. was really, really good. I figured, her best friend was uh I think it was was that her and Raquel Divine buddies. Can't you know, I think her and Raquel Divine kind of came in together. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's weird. I don't know her. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I know a lot about that era, but you know, with the things I don't, I guess I don't. So let me ask you: seeing the people I've gone through, seeing what we've talked about, who do you think the number one is? If you were to just guess, Ashley Blue. No, not Ashley Blue. Uh, then. Uh, Tory Lane, Aurora Snow. Gia Paloma. Oh my God. I know her quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I I if we are able to get Gia Paloma on the show, it'll be the last episode. So I, I can't take it above was, that. She was directing, you know, I was shooting camera for her for like two years, right before COVID. Mm -hmm. And she's got kids and everything. And I sure. think she's married and she's just completely left all poor. She has sure. nothing to do with it. But um I, when the first time I shot Gia, I shot one of her first scenes. She was still working at Starbucks. Wow. And I thought, I think she came by the office. We shot her a gag factor. And then she came by to visit. I said, Hey, we're doing a Bukaki later that night. If you want to stop by the set and see what it's like. So, whatever, whoever was driving her around, agent or whatever, uh, she came by the Bukaki. And then we would shoot her all the time. She was. Yeah, she's like on the cover of Fuck Pig and everything. I see Gia Paloma is a filthy fucking pig and all these uh, all these different lines. Yeah, she was, she's a, a what was that? Like, wink like a pig or what was that line we used to do? Um, squeal like a pig. Sure. And uh, yeah, Gia was a rego. She was, she liked getting monkey punched, you know, donkey punched. Donkey, that's punch that's what I was going to say. I think you were the first one to have that on film, right? I think I was. I look at you no, know, somebody had done it, but like Jeff Mike would see this shit. He goes, You need to do this. <laughs> so, yeah, I was Gia Paloma. It's in the, I think, a gutter mouth, right? Mm -hmm. we yeah, the, gutter yeah, mouth 30. I think some guy named Alex, maybe. Alex Sanders was yep. so good at the tough loves and all that stuff. Yeah, back in those days. And, um, yeah, Gia Paloma, she was great. Yeah, I'm that's another one. I, I my one of my favorite scenes. I shot her in a Filthy Things number is it one? I think Filthy Things number one. I shoot her in a fraternity house and there's literally a hundred drunken guys. You watch the scene, they're all around the thing and they're on a table. And Dave Hardman is fucking and wearing a gimp, a gimp mask. And we're taking this giant plexiglass tubes that were like to, to put to stick up her and they're shoving it up her and everything and it's it's in um yeah she's in a lot of those old she's the cover of mouth me take a look at the cover of mouth me one google it right now the cover oh yeah uh, like, uh, i am here yep yeah 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 oh that was uh or, or oh. mouth me two go she's number two maybe she's mouth uh, me two look at mouth me two uh, Powersville. Yeah, look at the Powersville movies. Yeah, number two. 
Uh, I can't oh, give me we one. Do hair yep, like yeah, on. yeah, and that's what I was gonna ask you. Uh, that was with the the I can't I can't show it because this is gonna eventually go on YouTube. But you got the monster eyes and the big eyelashes and the punk hair. The real it's yeah. uh that was two. Does that go back yeah. to some of your creativity in terms of you when you wanted to yeah, do yeah. Weird, weirder she looking went, stuff? Yeah, she's kept on a chain because she's a wild animal. And they bring her in the room and she's sniffing everybody like a like a dog. And then we turn her loose on them. And she blows like what I had, like 40 guys or something. I don't know. It says a number on the cover, but I'm sure. It says uh, eight girls, 52 cocks. Yes. Yeah, well, she probably, but she had the lion's share. Some are one on ones or whatever. <laughs> sure. But, but that's during that era when we needed all those numbers. You see, we, there was tons of this work. They do a bakaki, they come to a mouth meet, they get a blow, blow bang. We actually, we never did so, the, well, the blow bangs. We did do a blow bang. It was a dual. Remember, I used to do the suck off challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I like those. Yeah. I like those. Yeah. Yeah. We do the suck off challenges in those days. I didn't really need to blow bangs or your gang bangings or, I guess that is a blow bang, by it. You know what's so funny? Mouth me. I didn't even think about that. It's just a blow bang, isn't it? But we didn't call it back then. That. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. More things change, the more they stay the same, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I get people all the time will say things to me and say, oh, we need to do this. I'm like, Jesus, I shot that in 1994. You know what I mean? It's like, like, you know, like I even reverse gang because the first time I shot one like that, I was like, who is it? I think Rocco Sofredi. I did it with like 10 girls in 93. Jerry Pike, remember that guy? I did I, him yeah. in, a, in a Ferrari dealership or Porsche dealership doing like 12 girls back 94 ish, five, what about the same period? Hey, uh, one more and then we can wrap up. Um, only because I, I notice her here on this and it, it always makes me sad. How well did you know Haley Page? I'm gonna get the blonde. No, uh, she, she oh my was. God. She was married to Chico Wang. I knew her very well. Did you? Yeah. I shot her. We'll take a look. She's on the cover of Filthy Things Number One. Yep. Uh, I used to shoot her all the time, and she was very. very she's a good girl. We shot her a bunch, and she got caught up with Chico. And you're not supposed to talk about bad about the dead people, but Chico's a dick. Yeah. It wasn't. I did not like Chico. Yeah. Well, so. I mean, you turned out to be right on that one. Um, I think that's fair. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for indulging me on in all of that, Jim. Uh, anytime I talk to any of these new girls that we interview, I go like, so who are your favorites? And they go, you know, this person, this person. I want one girl to go, man, nobody fucked like Kelly Wells. I'll be like, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, she was wild. But that yeah. was that era, though. Right. Look at those girls you, you just brought up. Like, it, it's everybody, like every era kind of, it's it's different. But that was that era we were coming right out of that crazy era of like everyone upping each other into this into that era that they, they were like these superstars of fuck and they took it as a badge of honor that they would literally fuck the shit out of the guy and show up and destroy him and that's what these girls were like that's yeah. why I, that's why i call it the golden era personally yeah, yeah they were they really, really and everybody was shooting and so much of stuff was going you know it was just it was right you know especially the ones you're showing me there gia kelly because you basically brought 10 girls from the same era sure oh yeah. yeah well and i think i mean that was when shane and i were 15 to 25 you know and i i i go back and i look at the first porn dvd i ever bought uh, it was a uh, was a uh, fuck me uh, whatever um, I'm blanking on it now but I went back and I looked at it the other day and I went oh those are like all of my favorite girls like some of the Elisa Sparks and Annie Cruz uh, Gia Paloma yeah. well I'm surprised you don't have like Hannah Harper in there who else are some other ones uh, Tori Lane uh... I like Tori but you know what to me I, I know it sounds weird and this is probably going to be real insulting to my wife because I think she's beautiful but I really like that unconventional face and yeah, trust me. I mean, I like Tory Lane too, but it's more, those are more like a little symmetrical. You look at Gia Paloma and it's like, I don't know. Does it, uh, is it, is it insulting to say it feels a little more attainable than more of like the bimbo fied, you know, girls of today and stuff like that? I don't know. Whatever. 
Well, she looks pretty bimbo fight in that picture. <laughs> oh yeah, no, and that was I think that was later. She got the implants and stuff that, like that. Was at the ending. Take a look at her early stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I you know, I've seen I've seen plenty of it. Um, like I said, look at watch the scene. It's either filthy things one or two. Okay. It might be number two. Watch that scene with Gia Paloma. I I promise you, I've seen it, Jim. I yeah. guarantee you, I've seen it. It's insane. He's uh, seen it. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, tonight we had with us Mr. Jim Powers, uh, prolific director. Uh, I would say he's worked with everyone that I've ever loved in my life. Um, you can find him on Twitter at Jim Powers XXX, and uh, you know, check the episode description below for links to everything. Uh, in fact, I'll put a little thing on there for what is it, Kelroy? Yeah, yeah, uh, there you go, there you go, there's your links. Uh, Jim, thank you very much for coming on with us tonight. Cool. You guys have a good night. For your worst friend, I'm Matt. I'm Shane. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. All right. Take care, guys.